What's going on, guys? Today, we're going to be doing 10 questions for Christians from an atheist. The page on YouTube is The Non-Alchemist. Uh, it's about a two-year-old video. He poses some moral questions, some religious difference questions, and then I believe some naturalistic law and order questions. They're good questions. They're relatively short, so we should be able to burn through it pretty fast. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. We're gonna always talk about theology, and then we're gonna talk about a little bit of politics and culture as they relate to theology. It's always gonna go back there in one way or another. Uh, I was doing this for a long time. You can find a lot of old, old videos. I'm gonna start redoing a lot of those videos, responding to myself, um, because my opinion has changed on many things. But moving forward, it's gonna be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then one weekend release of some kind. But let's go ahead and jump right into it. So here is the video. First question. Have you read any first-hand materials criticizing your beliefs, or has it mostly come second-hand? What I mean by that is, are you, when you're learning about other positions, are you letting people that already agree with you uh, teach you everything you know, or are you actually going to the people who hold um, opinions that you don't agree with? Uh, and if you're not getting it from first-hand sources, why aren't you doing that? Okay, it's a good question, and I agree with what he's insinuating, and that is that if you are getting all of your understandings about your faith and really about anything, it extends past religion from secondhand sources only. A good example is Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or your friends or something like that. It's not a great source. Um, the only time I use Twitter or something as a source is if I have externally found sources that agree or verify that what Twitter is saying is the truth because Twitter lies in case you did not know that. To answer the question, um, yes, I've read tons of atheist books. Uh, I studied apologetics in college. I loved apologetics. When I started this YouTube channel and Instagram way back when, it was an apologetics page. It was called non-apologetics. So all I did was read the arguments against Christianity because I wanted to be able to really to defend my faith. But I, I'm also just very skeptical myself, and I'm very... um. I'm just not someone who believes things easily. So I've, I've always had a hard time with Christianity. Anybody who's been here for a while is well aware of that because it is not something I've hid. Um, but I've read The End of Faith. I've read The God Delusion. I've read tons of Hindu. Um, they don't call it scripture, but Hindu religious practices. I've read about Mormonism. I've read about the Muslim faith. I've read about Judaism. And I land where I land. Um, but I've read a lot of first-hand sources, and it's for good reason. And if you have not, as a Christian, I would urge you to do it. Because if it doesn't strengthen your faith, then you need to figure out what's going on. If it troubles you, or if you're afraid it's going to shake your faith, then honestly, your faith isn't that strong to begin with. And that's something you should reflect on. Second one. Mark Twain once said that the easy confidence with which I know another man's religion is folly teaches me to suspect that my own is also. Have you at least tried to apply the same level of skepticism that you have towards other religions to your own beliefs? Most of us can be biased. All right, another good question. And the answer is absolutely. I am a skeptic at heart. I always have been. I grew up Catholic. I denounced Catholicism for most of my young years into my young adult years. Uh, and like I said previously, and anybody who's been here long enough knows, uh, I question Christianity on the regular. Um, I don't like what the church does in general. I don't like how theology has turned out. I don't like what has happened to the Christian faith. I don't like a lot of things. Um, and it's not just the structure of Christianity, um, you know, being people, fallible people. But I also have problems with the scriptures. I have problems with the way that some things are explained. I have personal problems with some of the morality, uh, specifically Old Testament stuff. So I, I'm extremely skeptical about the Bible and about Christian ideologies and theologies. I always have been. It's not something I've hidden in any way. Um, I still land where I land, but I have a lot of doubts about a lot of different things. And I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think it's because I'm a very deep thinker. I also think it's because I am not a sheep. I'm not just going to believe what people tell me to believe. Uh, I'm gonna find out myself. And I honestly, I'm, I'm a verifiable person. Like I like, proof. And in a religious system of any kind, proof is hard. It's just the reality. It requires faith to some degree. It just, it really does. 
but moving on to three. Bias in favor of what we were raised to believe, or just what we want to be true. How are you personally trying to fight these all too human impulses? And related to that question, what kind, what kind of thing would lower your confidence in Christianity? Have you thought about that? What would lower your confidence in Christianity? If you- all right, so the question is, uh, most of us are biased to what we were raised to believe or what we want to believe. Completely agree. How are you personally trying to fight these impulses? And then he asked a follow-up of what would, you, what would lower your confidence in Christianity? It's a hard question, but it's a good question. One of the things that would lower my confidence in Christianity is if the world all of a sudden just became peaceful. If everybody started living in unison, if violence came to an end, if this culture war all of a sudden just stopped, if suddenly the concept of the Big Bang was proven or explainable in absolute terms to not have originated from God as I understand him, those are things that would rock my faith, you know, without a doubt. If they all of a sudden proved, because I'm not a Genesis guy, and I have a video on that. I do not believe Genesis was written literally. I don't believe that's literally how everything came to be. Uh, And alluding to his point that he's going to get at here in a minute is there's a lot of verifiable evidence that that story is just not true. And Christians will jump in hoops to try to make it literal and try to make it make sense so that they can stand by it. And I'm just not that person. I don't do that. Uh, I'm going to take new information as it comes. I'm going to try to reconcile it, but I'm not going to put my wants over, you know, what is real. What is real is what is real. And if something proves my previous thoughts, my preconceptions wrong, then, you know, so be it. Then I have to reassess the way that I believe or what I think. And I'm not just going to make up new versions. So that's not what happened to me with, you know, the way I think about Genesis. But there's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a lot of people, um, you know, at the academic level who don't interpret Genesis literally. It's been a, you know, it's been a long time theology that it's, you know, more poetry. It's more complicated than that. Like I said, I have a video on it. So if you're interested in that, go check that out. But those are my answers for that. Moving on to number four. People from other religions claim to be just as certain as you are, that the specific contents of their beliefs are true, based mostly on religious experience, then shouldn't that at least give you pause? I mean, how can you know that your experience of the divine is any more real than anyone else's from a different religion? What criteria would you use to figure that out? Suppose after a period of- All right, so uh, recap, all religions believe they are right on spiritual experiences. Does this give you pause? My answer is yes, absolutely. It gives me pause. And honestly, it gave me pause for several years of my life. Um, The fact that we have a vast array of religions that all believe you could say different things, and all of them claim that they have these spiritual experiences. Who am I to say that the Hindus aren't actually, they're all liars, they're all delusional. Oh, but so are the Muslims. So is the Joseph Smith crowd. Right. So so are the Jews. They're crazy. Everybody's crazy. But me, how arrogant of a thought process do you have to have when you look at how many world religions there are? But wait, there's more Then look at Christianity, which is the most divided religion on the planet. Sure, we mostly not all, but mostly believe the same fundamental truths. But we have disagreed on things to the point that we have split our own religion into more than 50,000 different versions of Christianity. So how arrogant would I be to not only say I am the right Christian of 50,000 different groups, more than that, I'm the right religion out of all of the world religions. To me, personally, I find that extremely arrogant. I find it extremely arrogant. But I believe at the same time, I believe God touches people and tries to show them different things at at different stages, and regardless of their belief system, I believe even atheists get touched and moved in certain ways by God. I just believe that they're not equipped to identify it, if that makes sense. Um, But I believe God does not speak directly or definitively, outwardly, audibly, verbally to anyone. So I don't believe anyone can firmly or absolutely claim that God has confirmed their personal faith. And that's kind of how it makes sense to me. I believe that it is our interpretation 
and our understanding of how God is touching us. And I believe Christianity is basically as close as it gets. Like I said, I don't believe Christianity has everything right. I don't think all of our ducks are in a row. But if I had to answer that question, that's basically how I would answer it. Everybody's different. Um, but I believe God touches all people in some way or another. I believe some people are equipped to understand or to be able to interpret it. I believe some people are not. Um, that's really it. I'm trying to keep this short. I could babble on. I'm going to stop. You have a long Five. involvement. A Mormon comes to question whether there's really anything supernatural going on in their religion after viewing the lives of many Mormons over the years. Should this give them, is this a good reason for them to start to maybe question their faith? And if it's a good reason for them to possibly consider that they're wrong, then can't you grant that, you know, the experience of a Christian going through a similar thing, could that also be a clue that they might be wrong? Christ so again, kind of a good question, kind of not. I wish he wouldn't have used Mormons because I feel like Mormons are the easiest to discount, but I'll answer it all the same. Not necessarily, but also yes. So it's kind of a difficult question to answer. Yes, because I think there is a lot of evidence that specifically, as I said, to Mormonism that really discounts what they believe. And if, if you really dig into Mormonism, um, it is a cult, man. Like at the, and I get, I get it. Every religion is a cult. I understand. I acknowledge it. I, I get what you're saying. But it's, it's more of a cult in our, our cultural understanding of the word cult. It's, it's an odd religious organization where they do odd things for no or odd reasons um, without historical backing, without any real exegetical backing. Um, it's just kind of random. If you look into Mormonism and the things they believe in, the things that they practice, it's just very odd. Uh, but also not necessarily because I'm self-aware enough to know that as a Christian, we believe our faith will be tested. So it's an inherent part of Christianity to have you question your faith. And as I said, anyone who's been around here for a while knows that I do that often. I have done that often publicly, question my faith, question things that I believe, question the church. Um, these are not things I've been shy about. These are not things I will ever try to hide from you guys. Um, because I've, I believe a lot of Christians feel that way, and I believe that they're afraid to say it. I believe there's too much fear that they will be judged by other Christians. I believe Christians think, especially on the internet, that they have to throw Bible verses up and they have to say, praise the Lord, and you know, say all the Christian quotes, uh, or else they're not good Christians. I'm just not that guy. Uh, I'm going to be honest, brutally. I'm going to tell you how I feel, and that's why constantly I say the way I feel and the things I think is constantly changing. It will always be constantly changing um, because this stuff is not easy, and it's not cut and dry, and it's not simple. It's extremely complex. So there's your answer. Mormons, bad example. Should have used something else, but answer all the same. Next question. Christians sometimes discount deconversion stories by pointing to scenarios in a person's life good around one. the time it might have happened. But if it's fair for Christians to do that, then why couldn't a skeptic do the same thing? Suppose a believer converts after, say, a pandemic. Is it fair for a skeptic to say, well, you, you know, they're just a Christian because of the pandemic? And if, if it's not fair for us to do that to you, then why would it be fair uh, for you to do that to us? Again, I think it, it's a great question because I do feel like that is something unfair and hypocritical that Christians do. Um, I think it does go both ways. I think you have people who convert both circumstantially, you know, outward things that affect them in their life, causing them to convert to Christianity. But I also believe it the other way around. I think it goes both ways. So I can't really give a good answer for this because I kind of fully agree with him. I think it's only fair that that goes both ways, that circumstantially and just things that, you know, touch a person's heart, either negative or positive. As a Christian, I believe if something touches your heart and you fall from Christianity, you know, I believe it's a false thing or it's something that's trying to lead you away um, or someone who's trying to lead you away. But the answer is all the same. I, I think it's it's hypocritical for us to just discount that, it, it, you know, if they move the other way, if someone falls away from Christianity and goes towards skepticism or atheism or another faith either way. But that does need to be fair because that's a logical inconsistency that, in my opinion, makes Christians look stupid or close minded 
if you want to be nicer about it. But either way, it's uh, it's a character flaw to think that way. It's a logical flaw to think that way, in my opinion. Next question. If there's an apparent conflict between your deeply held religious beliefs and the available public evidence, which do you or which would you default to? And if you say uh, your deeply held religious beliefs, what would you say to someone from a different religion that answered that question the same way that you did? If so quick recap, what he said was if there's an apparent conflict between your deeply held religious beliefs and the available public evidence. Me, what he's trying to say is things that could potentially disprove your religious beliefs. Which would you default to? The public evidence or to your religious beliefs? And then if the answer is religious beliefs, would you say that someone of a different religion who holds that same ideology, what would you say to that person? Um, again, it's going to be tough because I, I, you can't answer this without just spewing arrogance. And I'm not that guy. So I would default to my religious beliefs. Kind of. I would also fully embrace whatever the public evidence is. And I would try to see if there's any cohesion there. Is this cohesive in any way? Right? Like, again, example, going back to Genesis. If you believe the Big Bang was real, in my opinion, there's ways of thinking about that you know, in kind of an academic manner and not just being delusional, where you can, that still makes sense with the Christian story as a whole. Um, if you take Genesis literally, then you're going against basically all of the scientific community. And there's many Christians in science who agree with the Big Bang, right? So we have this public evidence. I absolutely look at the public evidence. It's not something I just dismiss because I want to stay in my delusion or I don't want my faith to be rocked or I don't want to question what I've believed my whole life. I'm not that person. I don't have anything against you if that is you. I would urge you to open your mind. Be a deeper person. Than that. Be a deeper thinker. If you're wrong, you're wrong. Is there any way that it still makes sense? Right? And then he goes on to say, what about other religious beliefs? I can't really speak to that. I believe there are certain religions that public evidence has completely destroyed. Things, again, like Mormonism. I don't think there's really any way in an academic or intelligent manner to defend Mormonism or Scientology. Things like this. There's too much public evidence uh, and historical evidence um, and logical evidence that just it's really tough to to be apologetic about right to have any sort of practice of apologetics about these religions but am i arrogant enough to say that i know all truth of all religions no i'm just not i'm just not i do believe in christianity i do believe we are missing pieces of it i do believe we have contorted and jacked up and twisted around many concepts many scriptures many ideas uh, many entire books, again, Genesis. Um, I think we've done a lot of things that have made it very confusing and that make it hard to defend your faith in the light of public evidence and things like that. But again, to keep it short, I'm going to shut up. If you lived in an ancient time and heard a voice claiming to be a perfectly good God that instructed you to offer a family member as blood sacrifice or to butcher, uh, intentionally butcher the children of the enemy... Mm. Would you be able to believe it? Uh, wouldn't you consider the possibility that you might be delusional? And if that's true, if you would, then why does it seem so easy for either you or maybe possibly your brethren to rationalize this kind of stuff when it appears in the Old Testament? Suppose. Now, this is one I kind of alluded to earlier on. I struggle with this, man. I am not going to lie. Some of the Old Testament. Now, I have, when, when I was in my master's program for uh, theology and Christian education, I wrote an entire project on the violence of the Old Testament because I just could not make sense of it. Morally, ethically, I just I, I had such a hard time justifying my faith and justifying God with what was displayed in the Old Testament. Specifically, then when you tie it to the New Testament where we have Jesus, the love of love of love of be nice to everybody and care and compassion and everything. Not to say he didn't go flip tables and get pissed off sometimes because he did. But 
the general consensus and the general thesis of the New Testament is to, you know, love thy neighbor, right? I genuinely struggle still, even after, you know, studying this in depth, reading thousands of pages uh, of academic work about it. I struggle with it, man. It's hard. I feel like I've come to grips with it enough to to get through it. But what would I believe it if God just came to me right now and told me to kill my kid and I have a kid? Uh, I'd struggle with it, man. I would think I was crazy, probably. I would think I was delusional. Again, because I don't think God speaks to people. Now, that was different in the Old Testament from everything we really read. If you believe the Old Testament, you believe the scriptures and you believe the exegesis and the human, blah, 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 then, then you believe God did speak to people verbally and audibly, right? So that's kind of the difference and why it makes it hard to answer the question. But even then, I'll give him credit. If I was then, if I was there in the Old Testament and God told me then when people around me had heard from God, right, verbally and audibly, I honestly still would think I was crazy. I honestly still probably wouldn't kill my kid. I would struggle with that. I would genuinely struggle with that. It's a hard question to answer. Do I want to say, yeah, I would just obey God? Sure. I want to say that, but I can't honestly. And if you know me, you know, I'm going to be honest. That's a freaking hard question. It's genuinely tough. So no, I would think I was delusional. And how do we rationalize it in the Old Testament was his follow-up question. I kind of already alluded to it. That that in and of itself, like I said, I've read thousands, thousands of pages. I have so many books on it. Uh, I can't answer that question here. But there are ways to rationalize it. When you look at justice and you look at the historical period in that time, like there, there, there is a lot to look at. But as I've said, I still struggle massively with it, even after reading all that. It's very tough to do. It's tough to feel good about what happened in the Old Testament in a lot of ways, in my opinion. Next question. Suppose that a pagan believes that Zeus causes lightning. Now, does our ability to explain lightning without any appeal to personal agents count as some evidence that their view is false? And if it does, then why do Christians, or maybe you, always seem to say that being able to explain things naturalistically doesn't actually work as an objection to your views? if you would see it as an objection to someone else's views. Pretty much. The answer is no. Um, does our ability to explain lightning discount their view? Uh, I mean, not necessarily, no. Because everything, and it's a science thing, um, everything has to originate from something, right? Things don't just magically poof into existence. It's just not how, it's not how things work. It's not how energy works, specifically. Um, so no, it wouldn't discount it. Do I think it's Zeus? causing lightning? No, but I wouldn't just discount it and say they're stupid. Um, lightning still has to come from somewhere. So even if, even if, you know, you see, you hear, well, you see in the case of lightning, it originates from something, whether it's, it's a collection of processes, those processes still start somewhere or whether it's, you know, a snap of one process and then bang, it still starts with a snap. What is the snap? Is that Zeus? I don't know. I believe these things originate, you know, when you step them back and step them back and step them back to God. And again, it's the same concept of the Big Bang Theory. Um, for Christians who, you know, take the Big Bang Theory as real, they believe that God brought everything into existence through a Big Bang, right? Because atheists can't answer that question. What caused the Big Bang? The science you love so much says that nothing just comes out of nothing. Something has to come from something. So when you trace all these somethings back, what or who caused the collection of somethings, right? So no. So to answer the second part, if so, why do Christians say naturalistic explanations don't apply when they apply to the Well, the same reason, right? Everything I just explained. It all goes back to something. And in my case, I believe it is a someone, not a something. Question 10 every culture without exception believed that it was obvious that the earth was flat, unmoving, and that the sky was solid until these things were scientifically disproven. Now, given these facts, why should we, if we're so wrong about the natural world in many cases, why should we privilege what appears to be obviously true, like, I guess, designed to some people? If we're so wrong about a lot of stuff about the natural world in those other instances, 
then obviously shouldn't that make us more skeptical about what appears to be obviously true? All right, that's the end of the video. My answer is, you know, a mixture of things we've honestly already talked about. Um, yes, I agree. We should be skeptical about all these things because, yeah, there was a time when everybody thought the earth was flat. There was a time when everybody thought that the sky was solid. There was a time when people thought that rain came from this and that wind meant this and that, you know, all these things that over time through science and through experience and through other things, you know, we've learned to not be true. But at the end of all of that skepticism, you still have to account for where did it come from? Sure, you can explain to me where rain comes from. But what, when, whether it was a month ago, a year ago, or a billion years ago, what caused that process to come into effect? There has to be an endpoint somewhere. It just, that's how science works. So if you're a Christian, these are good ways to talk to atheists because they can't account for that. And it's not a gotcha, just like I don't feel like he's doing a gotcha to me. Or to whoever, you know, obviously it's not to me, but whoever he's posting this to, which is the world. I don't feel like, I felt like he did this, you know, fairly respectfully. Um, but atheists can't account for the, the, or, the, the true, the origin of anything. They say the Big Bang. Cool. The Big Bang wasn't magic. And if it is, then you're admitting there is something supernatural. Whether you want to say it's the Christian God or the, the Hindu God or whatever, you have to admit that per your rules, because they love science so much, right? Science is their thing. They love it. It's their favorite. Um, science says nothing, something cannot come from nothing. So it has to originate somewhere. So that's a great, it's a great talking point when you feel like an atheist is trying to back you into a corner. And don't be a jerk. That's just like, I don't feel like I was a jerk with this. Don't be a jerk when talking to them. Just challenge them because they're definitely going to challenge you. Don't lie. Don't be arrogant. Don't think that you know everything. And don't think that your religion is the all-powerful, blah, 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 when it's the statistical probability that Christianity, as you personally believe it or were taught it, is absolutely without flaw, goes against what your own faith believes. Just grasp that for a second, and it will humble you. You're a Christian. You're a certain kind of Christian, whether it's non-denominational, whether it's Protestant, whether it's, um, you, there, <laughs> there's so many, whether it's any of the 50 plus thousand denominations, Orthodox, whatever it is, Methodist, right? Baptist, we can keep going. They all think they're right. They all think about their version, what you think about your version. Why are you so special? I don't believe that. I believe we all have pieces of this unsolvable puzzle. And the more we separate and sow discord amongst ourselves, specifically within Christianity, but I personally extend that out to other religions, the more we do that, the, I, I believe the less of God we're going to understand. I think instead, we need to figure out ways that they are cohesive, ways that they do fit together things that we all agree on, and then be okay with us having different spiritual experiences and different ideas about different things. I think it's really important. I promise I'm going to keep this short, so I'm going to shut up. I love you guys. I hope you have a great week. Uh, next video will be on Friday. I have no idea what it's going to be yet, so I'll let you know when I do. Have a great night.